Thank you for watching or listening to this free podcast of the Young Turks. We wanna make sure that you get some portion of the show every day. But if you want the full show, which is actually five segments, come become a member and support independent media as well. TYTnetwork.com slash join. Meanwhile, enjoy the free podcast. Welcome to the Young Turks. Awesome show ahead for you guys. We got a lot of great shows, in fact, that I wanna tell you about coming up. Uh, March 19th, we're gonna do another Bernie Sanders uh, town hall event uh, online. Uh, Young Turks and a number of other partners, uh, and it is going to be about income inequality. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren joining Bernie Sanders in that town hall. That's great. Michael Moore, economist Derek Hamilton. So we'll bring that to you. Uh, so tune in at the regular time, and then we'll uh, go to the town hall uh, when uh, that begins. That's on March 19th. That's a Monday, March 20th. As a Tuesday, and we have election night coverage, the Illinois primary. Lots of really important races in Illinois. Uh, every primary night, check out the Young Turks election coverage right here on tytnetwork.com slash live. That's also where you can get the uh, Bernie Sanders Town Hall. Okay, uh, on today's show, awkward moments with Donald Trump. Uh, so uh, I got one coming up for you in the first story. I got one coming up for you in the next segment. I've got a fun prediction for you guys today. And um, a absolutely critical meeting uh, that uh, Mueller is now digging into. It's a meeting that I told you about uh, almost a year ago now, uh, and and I said it would be of great import, and it looks like it now is. So uh, all that on the program today. Let's get started. Okay, Gary Cohen's the top economic advisor to President Trump. He's leaving. Uh, the ostensible reason is he disagrees uh, about the steel and aluminum tariffs. Now, as I explained to you when that news, news first broke, um, <laughs> nobody's nose got broken, by the way. When the news first broke, um, uh, it's not about that. That's what everybody's reporting. No, there's two reasons why Gary Cohn's leaving. Uh, one is uh, they already got the tax cuts. That's trillions of dollars in tax cuts for corporations and the rich. That was his number one objective. Steel and aluminum tariffs are tiny in comparison. Uh, and number two, he's getting out before the indictments. It's in White House in complete and utter chaos. And who the hell wants to stay in that building any longer than they have to? And Cohn thinks, we're not going to get anything else done. And so I, I got the tax cuts and I'm out E5000. So uh, and this is going to be his last cabinet meeting. So he's sitting on the side because he's not in the cabinet, he's an advisor. Uh, but Trump decides that he's going to say goodbye to him. Oh, no, don't. Just be quiet. Just. Let it go. No, instead this. This is Gary Cohn's last meeting in the cabinet and of the cabinet, and he's been terrific. He may be a globalist, but I still like him. <laughs> <laughs> he's seriously a globalist, no question. But you know what? In his own way, he's a nationalist because he loves our country. He's going to go out and make another couple of hundred million, and then, <laughs> then he's going to maybe come back. We might come back, right? We'll be here Absolutely. another seven years, hopefully, and it's a long time. But I have a feeling you'll be back. I don't know if I can put him in that same position, though. <laughs> He's not quite as strong with those tariffs as we want him to be. What is that? That's maniacal. <laughs> okay. In case you don't know the other meaning of globalist, let's go to Talking Points memo. While the term globalist can refer to a person who advocates for economic and foreign policy in relation to developments throughout the rest of the world, the term is more widely considered an anti-Semitic dog whistle. By the way, Gary Cohn is Jewish. Uh, oops, look, even if you meant the other version of globalist, mm, since the version that is more widely known is widely known, I wouldn't have talked about it in reference to a Jewish person who's leaving your administration. Anyway, look, that's one part of it. Um, the second part of it is, what are you doing? Just let him go and say thank you for your service. Instead, makes it horribly awkward. He's not as strong on terrorists, but he'll probably go and come back. He'll come back, he'll come back. In other words, damn it, I didn't want him to leave. And oh, I bet he comes back, I bet he does. And he'll make a couple hundred million dollars and come back. By the way, that's the problem. He He was the president of Goldman Sachs. There's a revolving door, that's why they call them government sacks. They go in, they get trillions of dollars in breaks for Goldman Sachs and their friends, which is exactly what Gary Cohen did. 
and then go back out, make a couple hundred million dollars more, and then come back in and rig the rules again. If you're looking for who rigged the rules, it's guys like Gary Cohn. So I got no love for Gary Cohn, but I even I wouldn't have sent him out like that. <laughs> That's just uncalled for. Okay. Um, so now uh, let's go to that's just a quick story, uh, fun for everybody. Uh, let's go to uh, Huckabee Sanders. Okay, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders stepped in it uh, for understandable reasons on the issue of Stormy Daniels. Now, Stormy Daniels is the adult actress uh, who had an affair with Donald Trump. Uh, she explained it in gory detail back in 2011. Uh, Donald Trump uh, apparently got his lawyer Michael Cohen to do an NDA. Uh, now. Michael Cohen says, look, I happen to do the NDA and I happen to pay the $130,000 on my own. I, Donald Trump, I don't know. Well, Michael Cohen didn't sleep with her. Donald Trump slept with her. So obviously that's who it was for. Now um, Stormy Daniels has come out and said, the NDA is not valid. Donald Trump never signed it. Michael Cohen signed it. That doesn't make it valid. I that It was not to hush up about anything related to Michael Cohen, it was to a hush contract about the affair that she had with Donald Trump. Okay, so now Sarah Huckabee Sanders has to answer questions about that. She's gotta say that it's resolved and that it's not an issue. Well, she's in an impossible situation because Donald Trump has asked her to lie in 13 different ways. And so she accidentally screws up and admits something that's true. Now, her overall statement, don't get me wrong, she's the press secretary for Donald Trump. Her overall statement is not true. But a part of it is, so that's really important. Let me show it to you and then I'll explain. Made very well clear that none of these allegations are true. This case has already been won in arbitration and anything beyond that, I would refer you to the president's outside counsel. And again, this case has already been won in arbitration. Anything beyond that, I would refer you to outside counsel. You said that there's arbitration that's already been won by whom and when? Uh, by the president's personal attorneys, and for details on that, I would refer you to them. So, what can more can you share with us? I can share that uh, that the arbitration was won in the president's favor. Yeah, I've had conversations with the president about this, um, and as I outlined earlier, that this case had already been won in arbitration. Oops. So the reporter had a puzzled look on his face, and rightfully so. Did you say there was arbitration? When I saw the headline, I thought the same thing. What arbitration? It turns out there was arbitration in the case, which Sarah Huckabee Sanders should not have admitted because that admits that Donald Trump is involved. It was hush money for covering up Donald Trump's affair. She should not have admitted that. Now, is it true? Absolutely true, no question about it. So but what's the untrue part of her statement? That he won the arbitration. So they went to an arbitration hearing without Stormy Daniels, Michael Cole, Cohen, Trump's lawyer called for a secret arbitration meeting. That's not how it works. You gotta let the other side know. So that arbitration meeting was nonsense anyway. Second of all, they didn't win it. They got a temporary restraining order saying, hey, Stormy Daniels, don't talk about this in public until we actually have the proceedings and conclude them. That is not winning an arbitration proceeding. She didn't even show up, she didn't even know what was happening. And number three, he didn't sign the contract. Trump didn't sign the contract. So you can't have an arbitration proceeding about a contract that doesn't exist. So about the substance of her, of winning it, she's absolutely wrong. The fact that it happened is absolutely correct. Oops. So that then makes Trump apparently angry. CNN's Jim Acosta mainly doing the reporting here. I will have a summary here for you from the Hill. CNN's Jim Acosta reported that Trump is, quote, very unhappy with his press secretary after she acknowledged at a press briefing on Wednesday that Trump has been involved in a legal dispute with Daniels stemming from her allegations. So today, of course, the Trump White House is denying, mainly through Fox News. Sources tell Fox News, no, 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 he's fine with it. No, 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 no problem at all. So Sarah Huckabee Sanders came out for a press conference today. Oh, no, right, she didn't. She canceled the press conference basically in hiding in a bunker. So if Trump is not upset with her and there's no issues about what she said, they have a curious way of showing it. Let me give you one more of, uh, of CNN reporting here. Abby Phillips again referring, Abby Phillips referring to Acosta's source saying, according to this source, Sarah Sanders comments were essentially putting the Stormy Daniels storyline on steroids yesterday. And if in case you're wondering why Trump cares so much, he's had Dozens of affairs, he's had 
Dozens of women accuse him of sexual harassment and assault, which is far worse than any affair. Well, Stormy Daniels in her latest court filing said that she has texts and pictures. That's why he was trying to cover it up. And that's why he's upset at Sarah Huckabee Sanders for screwing up and admitting that it's real and that it is his contract, even though he didn't sign it. One last thing, people are getting all over Sarah Huckabee Sanders here, and I'm gonna do an ironic defense. That job is impossible. Trump asked you to lie in both directions. It's not doable. Uh, Trump is uh, not at all involved, but he won the case. You can't do both. And then Trump tells you to do one thing, as he apparently told her. And then when she does it, and it backfires and blows up in his face, he doesn't want to admit that he's wrong because he's a child. So he says, no, you did it wrong. (laughs) Gary Cohn left, are you kidding me? (laughs) Who can stand this guy? Of course he left, everybody's gonna leave. I'm surprised Sarah Huckabee Sanders has hung in there for that long. It's a miserable, miserable job to have. Okay, um, now uh, let me go to my fun prediction, okay? We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor sharp commentary and just the right amount of vulgarity the unftr podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows but don't just take my word for it the new york times described unftr as consistently compelling and educational aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school for as the great philosopher yoda once put it you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Rex Tillerson is our Secretary of State. Uh, he was the former CEO of Exxon Mobil. And I've been telling you for a long time that he was put in uh, to that position because of a deal that the Russian government uh, cared a lot about. It was a deal between Rosneft, which is the huge uh, oil and gas company in Russia, and Exxon Mobil. They were going to explore a, a portion of uh, Russian, it's mainly the seas, as you'll see in a second, uh, above Russia. And, and it was a half a trillion dollar deal um, on paper. It, the proceeds were supposed to net out the revenue overall from the oil that they would get there, nine trillion dollars. Absorb that number, that is not nine million, that is not nine billion, that is nine trillion. So that's a lot of money at stake and, and why Russia cares so much about this. So that's why Donald Trump out of nowhere picked the CEO of ExxonMobil to be our Secretary of State, which makes no sense at all. So they wanted to lift the sanctions so ExxonMobil could go forward with that deal with Rosneft. Now it didn't work out because Congress said, hell no. If Senate, for example, voted 98 to 2 to maintain those sanctions and even add more sanctions on top. Now Trump has not been, has not put the new sanctions into place. But he can't lift the old sanctions, so those are still in place. But then the second thing happened, oil prices dropped, making that really expensive exploration um, not as worth it economically as it used to be. So today the news is uh, ExxonMobil has canceled that deal, Hmm. which is gonna lead to my prediction in a second. But first, let me give you the full context here. Go to the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Tillerson touted the agreement as a breakthrough, giving Exxon access to one of the world's greatest unexplored oil and gas basins. This was back when they made the deal. The company reportedly spent about $700 million to drill the first well, likely making it the most expensive ever 
It struck oil, according to Rosneft, but further exploration was halted because of US sanctions imposed by the Obama administration following Russia's intervention in Ukraine in 2014. In case you were wondering why Russia supports Donald Trump and the Republican Party and not the Democrats. Both Obama and Hillary Clinton were in favor of those sanctions. And the Russians had nine trillion reasons why they didn't want the Democrats in charge in America. So now why does Exxon care so much? Well, for similar reasons. The joint venture between Exxon and Rosneft included exploration in the Kara Sea, as well as other collaborative efforts in Russia. And the US Exxon funded and in the US Exxon funded the exploration work entirely, earning a 33.3 stake in any discoveries. So if they were gonna have nine trillion in revenue, I can do the quick math for you on that. That's three trillion dollars on the line. So everybody that was involved in that deal desperately wanted that deal to go through. Hence a lot of the drama that we have seen about Trump and the Russian collusion, I believe. So. But now Exxon is saying, we're done. We can't reverse a 98 to 2 vote from the Senate. Besides which, at, this, at these oil prices, it's not worth it. So the company said it would formally begin to withdraw from the Rosneft joint ventures this year, taking a $200 million loss after taxes. So look, $200 million is significant. That's painful, and that's why they didn't want to let it go. But given the amount of money they could have made, it's a drop in the bucket. So they just cut their losses at, at this point. But they could come back to it. And in fact, the Russians in the Wall Street Journal article kept saying, no, 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 you never know. You never know. We were, we're open to doing it again. And you know, I wondered, and so you might have wondered, why didn't the Russians just do the deal with someone else? Why do they want to bother going into so much trouble and making sure there's a recent story that just came out a couple of days ago about how the Russians apparently back channeled to Trump. This is what Mueller is investigating, at least, that they did not want Mitt Romney as Secretary of State. He had had some tough rhetoric against Russia. They wanted their friend, and and that is literal. Rex Tillerson is a friend of Vladimir Putin, has gotten a medal from him, is a very good friend of the guy who runs Rosneft. They go, they used to go biking together, <laughs> picturing him on bicycles, going up a hill, motorcycles. Anyway, uh, and and so they wanted their friend in that position to lift the sanctions. Again, that didn't work out. But why Exxon? Well, experts say it is unlikely that Rosneft will be able to find another company able to step into Exxon's role, either due to European sanctions or a lack of technical capabilities to drill offshore wells. So one more piece of context on that. Russia's federal budget relies on oil and gas sales for around one third of its revenues. Without technology from partners such as Exxon, Russia will struggle to access those resources. So if you're wondering why Russia went through all that effort, I told you nine trillion, but look, it's a third of their federal budget. It is gigantic. What wouldn't you do for a third of your federal budget? And that is why I believe and I have maintained from day one that that is what all of this collusion is about. It's not about trifling Twitter impressions and 21 Tumblr accounts. This was the deal they were concerned about. So now, as usual, I have a fun prediction for you guys, and I will say it ahead of time, and you'll get to see if I'm right or wrong. I believe Rex Tillerson will leave the administration very soon. So tick tock, tick tock. Now that the Exxon Mobil deal is not going to happen with Rosneft, he has no reason to stay. The whole point of him going there was to do lift the sanctions and do this deal. Now, they're gonna start handing out indictments soon at the Trump White House. Anyone with two bits of sense is running for the hills. Hope Hicks is gone, McMaster's leaving. Obviously, Gary Cohn just left. Everybody had a different agenda. Gary Cohn's agenda was pass trillions of dollars in tax codes for the rich and for huge corporations like Goldman Sachs where he worked. Rex Tillerson wanted huge deals for ExxonMobil where he worked. Now that he's not going to get that, he's going to leave. And at the time, they will say, "Oh no, his he you know wants to spend more time with his family," and he disagreed with Trump on some trifling issue that's not really the issue at hand. But he is gone. He's gone because Exxon's not doing the deal anymore. This is how corruption works. Okay, now um, we're going to take a break. When we come back, you want to talk about corruption? So. Mueller finally apparently has some evidence and and is working on that secret meeting that Eric Prince had with the Russians in Seychelles Island. I told you about that almost a year ago. Now 
you're gonna begin to see how important that is as this whole case comes together. And that's why you're seeing all these people pull the shoot from the Trump administration. If you don't think it's real, well, Gary Cohen does and about a dozen or so people who left Trump's White House recently do. So we'll come back and I'll tell you all the details. You're right in the middle of this podcast. We got another great segment coming up for you. If you'd like the full show, which is actually five segments, Go to tytnetwork.com slash join, you become a member, you support the show, you support independent media, and you get the whole two hour show ad free every day. Let's go do it now. Um, all right, um, we've got a lot of tweets for you guys, we've got breaking news for you guys. And I forgot to tell you that um, after the Young Turks today, uh, Rebel headquarters has Dennis Kucinich. He'll be on the program. And James Thompson, the guy who almost won in a special election in Kansas. And since he came so close to winning in a really Republican district, the Democrats, Democratic Party has decided they're not going to support him. Okay, anyway, see a pattern here? Um, okay, uh, Sean Phoenix says uh, about the tape we just watched, he was screaming for help from the police. He was getting punched in the head while screaming for help. I'm surprised he didn't get shot while running away. The cops escalated the situation hard. Uh, Michael Graham says, I live in Asheville and everybody jaywalks. I have never heard of anyone getting a ticket, much less arrested for that. Uh, yeah, because they go to pick on people. And gee, I wonder who they're going to pick on. The powerless, of course, right? Um, Danger Carlos Danger says, I was illegally searched, arrested, and robbed by a cop. And all I can think about about that now is that if I were black, I'd have been shot because I had a pocket knife. At TYT, we frequently talk about all the ways that big tech companies are taking control of our online lives, constantly monitoring us and storing and selling our data. But that doesn't mean we have to let them. It's possible to stay anonymous online and hide your data from the prying eyes of big tech. And one of the best ways is with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN hides your IP address, making your active ID more difficult to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your network data to protect you from eavesdroppers and cyber criminals. And it's also easy to install. A single mouse click protects all your devices. But listen guys, this is important. ExpressVPN is rated number one by CNET and Wired Magazine. So take back control of your life online and secure your data with a top VPN solution available, ExpressVPN. And if you go to expressvpn.com slash TYT, you can get three extra months for free with this exclusive link just for TYT fans. That's expressvpn.com slash TYT. Check it out today. Jeez, yeah. You know what? That's that's deep, man, and it's true. Like, uh, I don't know if that, of course, I, I don't know for a fact that that would have happened to you. Would no, none of us do? But um, they do interpret different situations differently based on on some factors, including, of course, race. Um, so, anyway, glad you're with us. All right, uh, what's the breaking news, Anna? All right, the breaking news is. Kim Jong-un has offered Donald Trump an invitation to meet. And in that invitation, he also indicated that he will halt all nuclear missile testing. Now, this is an interesting development. We do know that South Korea and North Korea have been engaged in diplomatic talks. And that happened prior to the Olympics. And I guess those talks have continued. But this is a good sign. However, I... I feel skeptical about all of this. We'll see how this all turns out. Apparently, Trump made the announcement and his staff was caught off guard, which- um, Which is typical Trump fashion. Exactly, right? like they're probably, no, wait, wait, hold on. We should think about what our response, oh, there he goes. Okay, now should Trump pull a Rodman and go to North Korea? Then he's not gonna go to North Korea, but should they actually meet? I don't know, look, I-, I, I I don't, there's, there's two different sides here. One is, I don't trust anything the North Koreans say. They're Trumpian. They, they say one thing, the next day they say the next, and it's all a bunch of stupid games, and it's really annoying, and, and they're not remotely trustworthy, the North Korean government, obviously. Um, on the other hand, I believe in talking to your enemies. So the preposterous idea of, uh, and, and neocons always said this, and they still say it about Iran, we shouldn't talk to our enemies. Well, okay, but we could talk to our friends all day long. That's not gonna help resolve any conflict. That's right. In order to resolve a conflict, you gotta talk to your enemy. 
So I, yeah, I guess I would say do it, but with a lot of reservations and safeguards in place. Well, the thing that concerns me is that we're talking about Trump and he's not He's the type of person who admittedly is not interested in national security briefings or briefings in general. And so he doesn't strike me as someone who is knowledgeable on the nuances of this very important foreign policy issue. But with that said, I do think that this is a considerable step up from what he was doing before, which was tweeting juvenile tweets and making fun of Kim Jong Un's weight. Yeah, so. I wonder if you'll call him Rocket Man to his face. Uh, but uh, you know, actually, Anna, I hadn't thought about it that way, and that is a counterpoint to, to meeting. Because if the North Koreans are savvy, all they'd have to do is, um, oh, Mr. Trump, we did not realize how stunningly handsome you are in that's, person. That's exactly what I mean. I, I, I feel like Trump softens toward people who say nice things to him, who compliment him, who boost his ego, and. Kim Jong Un is a terrible person, but he strikes me as a little smarter than Trump is. But that's a really low bar. It is a low bar. Okay, yes. super low bar. Uh, and so if they come in and go, Mr. President, your hands are awfully large. Uh, he oh, might go. You know what? Continue with that nuclear testing. I, I no, like no, but I'm not big, big, beautiful nuclear tests. He might literally come out and go, look on the nuclear testing. He denied it. He strongly denied it. Right, and so. I think these, there's some good people, there's some bad people there, but there's some good people in the North Korean government. I mean, they've got some bad concentration camps, and they've got some good concentration camps. So, you know what? Actually, a lot of the rest of the world might be missing an opportunity here. It is actually incredibly easy to rook Donald Trump. Right. And so, even with the issue of Israel, for instance, and building the settlement. So one day he's 100% pro Israel. I'm going to name Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Boom, it's done. And then the next day he'll criticize Netanyahu over the settlements. Yeah. And so he, it really depends on who he's communicating with on any given day or in any given hour or any mood that he has. And you, he could, if he was smart, he could use that as a negotiation strategy. He has no strategy. So Israel, their government, led by Netanyahu, who apparently is very corrupt, unsurprising, he's terribly right wing, got no interest in him, but he is a savvy guy. Nobody thinks he's stupid, and so he does the smart thing, which unfortunately a lot of countries could do if they had bad intent in negotiating with us. Whenever Trump says something that Netanyahu likes, oh, you want to move the embassy? Deal, done, thank you, all right? And he says something they don't like, you should get rid of the settlements. Just wait him out, wait till tomorrow, and he'll forget about it. And then whenever he says something you like, I'll take it, okay? So I hope the North Koreans don't do that to him, but at a bare minimum, at least we're talking, and it's an interesting offer. Right. Moving on to other news, a new report by the Electronic Frontier Foundation found that the FBI was working with members of the Geek Squad at Best Buy in order to catch individuals who had child pornography on their computers. So the idea here was that if someone had computer issues and the Geek Squad was working on that computer issue, the FBI would pay members of the Geek Squad to turn in that person if they had pornographic child pornography on that computer. So this is a little bit of an issue because of course the FBI, any law enforcement should have a warrant before going through anyone's computer. And in this case, the Geek Squad essentially worked as an arm of the FBI because they were informants. The FBI paid Best Buy Geek Squad employees as informants, rewarding them for flagging indecent material when people brought their computers in for repair. So how did this case even come about? Well, of course, it involved one specific individual who fought back. His name is Mark Rettenmayer. He's from Orange County, California, a physician and surgeon. He took his computer in for repair when it wouldn't boot up. Uh, Now, he faced child pornography charges after a Geek Squad employee flagged his computer to the FBI. So he had child pornography on his computer. That's obviously an issue. But here's the thing. If you obtain evidence in an unlawful way, that evidence gets thrown out in court. And that's exactly what happened here. A federal judge threw out almost all the evidence because of false and misleading statements an FBI agent made in an affidavit to get a search warrant for uh, uh, the defendant's house. So... Again, it, it, 
it doesn't even lead to the results that the FBI would want because they're obtaining this evidence in an unlawful fashion. So a um, couple of issues here. Look, everybody wants the guys looking at child porn to get caught. But you can't let that cloud your judgment on how we run justice in this country. We've got to abide by the United States Constitution. So, and this is actually a pretty good case showing you why, if you don't, the trouble that it can create. So they catch a couple of people on child porn. Great, okay. But they're, the FBI is asking them to flag indecent material. All right, where is your line on indecent material? And then the question is, are they, if the, does it just pop up on the computer? And they're like, oh, well, I saw it. There's nothing, I can't unsee it. I'm going to report it. Or are they going fishing? And in the case that Anna was telling you about, they went to a different part of his computer that had nothing to do with fixing it to go find that stuff. Why? The FBI is paying them 500 bucks a pop. So now you've incentivized every person that you're working with at the Geek Squad to go fishing, mm -hmm. look at all parts of the computer to see if you can find anything on this person who asked you for help. Okay, and this is supposed to be a private corporation whose job it is to help you with your computer. Instead, they're looking to entrap you. And so, totally unacceptable, not even close. And then after. They give them that evidence, the FBI then goes and gets a warrant and then tears your place That's apart. That's right, exactly. Yeah. So so the way in which they obtain that warrant um, is, is not valid because they can't do that. They can't tell Geek Squad employees, we'll give you money if you fish around and you find uh, indecent material. Um, so Best Buy has responded to this and Best Buy has said, look, if in the process of fixing the computer, our employees come across child pornography. They have not only a moral obligation, but in 20 states in the US, they have a legal or yeah, legal obligation to come forward. But understand that you know this case is different because the employees implicated in this case or in these cases essentially went through the consumer's computers in order to find the indecent material. And Best Buy said three out of the four employees don't work there anymore, and the fourth employee was uh, reprimanded and reassigned um, because they took money. Uh, so if you're taking money to try to find incriminating stuff on people's computers who trusted you to fix it, that's obviously a problem for Best Buy. All of this is a huge problem for Best Buy because at this point, you know, how many other informants does the FBI have inside the Geek Squad, and do you trust your computer uh, to be handed over to them? So. Best Buy's got to be in a bit of a panic here in terms of what it does to its customers. And and look, one last thing. They find the child porn. We got to follow the right procedure, but nobody's broken up about the defendants in those cases. Right. Right. But with the government, the slope always slips, right? And we just did a story about how the cops used tasers. They were supposed to use them initially in in. In, in place of shooting someone, now they just use them willy nilly whenever the defend, whenever the guy is not listening to him, right? Right. So it starts with child porn, which everybody's like, yeah, go get the sons of bitches, right? And then all of a sudden it's indecent material, and all of a sudden they're fishing all of your computer to find any kind of dirt on you. So you're, I, I, I usually don't like slippery slope arguments, but I think in this case you're absolutely right. I mean, we see it with the NSA, for instance, and what Edward Snowden leaked to the public. I mean, they were just indiscriminately spying on all of us, every single one of us, with you know no probable cause and collecting met, metadata on us. So government overreach in that regard is. Already, you know, there's precedent for that. Now, with that said, though, what I find interesting is every job has rules, right? Every job requires you to conduct your work ethically and to follow certain rules. So, for instance, in our case, um, we could make up super scandalous, salacious stories and probably increase our views, but we're making up stories. You can't do that, right? That is a fireable offense. Why is it that with law enforcement, in this case the FBI, they do something unlawful? You need a warrant to, to search people, but oh, they got caught. Let's focus on the Best Buy employees and whether or not there were consequences for them. But for the FBI, did they get punished for this at all? And the guy who had the child porn goes off. Exactly. He gets off. I'm not sure I'm happy about that. But the guys who started the problem in the first place, the FBI, of course, they're the people in power, so no ramifications. Until Trump hears this story, then he'll probably use it like, oh, the FBI knew it. 
I, I bet you that Andrew McCabe slash Hillary Clinton made him do it. <laughs> okay, but what, you know, guys, I actually do have one last point about this because I think it's important. For all the people they didn't find child porn on, that didn't mean that doesn't mean they didn't go through your computer and look at all your porn anyway, right? Right? Or look at all the other your your finances. Your I don't know if you've got medical information on your computer. I don't know what kind of info you have. Basically, the FBI told these guys go look, rummage through their whole computer. And so they know all that embarrassing stuff about you because the FBI was paying them in case they could find something illegal in your computer. That's a terrible idea and a horrible invasion of privacy. Mark Cuban, he might be in a bit of trouble. Let's talk about it. A security guard or former security guard from a bar in Portland, Oregon has come forward to corroborate allegations that Mark Cuban had sexually assaulted a woman at that bar back in 2011. Now back in 2011, the woman did go to police and did file a police report and cops did investigate the allegations, but they decided not to, the prosecutor decided not to pursue the case because there was a lack of evidence. However, now Chris Christopher White, who was a security guard working at that bar at that time, said he saw the NFL, uh, I'm sorry, NBA basketball team owner in the barrel room with his entourage and witnessed Cuban putting his arm around a woman for a photo. Now, here is the relevant part of what Christopher White had to say. She jumped away like she was not happy with him. That's when the energy in the room kind of exploded. So the allegation uh, by the woman was that he put his hand down her jeans, the back of her jeans, and uh, penetrated her with his fingers. Um, now, Christopher White said, I didn't have a camera on his hand, but it sure looked like it was too low to be just on her back. And he also said that Cuban appeared to be uh, heavily intoxicated. He was slinking around all over the place. I believe we told him we couldn't serve him any alcohol. Uh, also, uh, White says that Cuban would point his finger at women with whom uh, he wanted to be photographed and beckoned them. The way Cuban touched some of the women struck White as inappropriate because his hands moved well below the middle of their backs, he said. White also said that uh, he was never interviewed by police, but later told a friend that he, what he had witnessed. Um, the friend confirmed to uh, Oregonian uh, Oregon Live that White had told him the same account. So they made sure to corroborate what White had said to his friends. So uh, look, these are interesting allegations, and I'm curious to see how it plays out. Apparently, the N NBA has decided to launch an investigation um, against Mark Cuban, and we'll see what the results of that investigation will be. But it is important to point out that the cops did interview uh, several other employees at the bar, and uh, none of them uh, said that they noticed anything strange. That's pretty important. So I have mixed feelings about this story, and not because sometimes I get confused for Mark Cuban. Mm -hmm. um, so, look, uh, on the one hand, um, sh why would she make it up? And uh, and he remembers it from the time the security guard does, and told a friend, and that friend said, "Yes, he told me at the time." She remembered, obviously, remembers it, and filed with the police immediately. Mm -hmm. Uh, and told her boyfriend, and her boyfriend was really mad. Obviously, he remembers it from the time, so they're not making it up later. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are four witnesses who say they didn't see it. They can't say definitively that it didn't happen, but they, the cops talked to four people, the manager at the barrel room, two security workers, and a bartender. All uh, four said they saw no misconduct from Cuban. Now, again, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It means they didn't see it, right? Um, it's... Uh, and, and then what he describes, the security guard who now says, Christopher White, who says that he thinks it might have happened. He didn't say that he saw him doing it. He said he saw his hand going lower than the waist, she jumped, and then the energy in the room exploded. Other people say, and I question the other four witnesses a little bit because they say, no, nobody noticed anything and it was no big deal. Well, she went and filed with the police. so. It seems more credible that the energy in the room would have changed, etc. But on the other hand, Christopher White didn't actually see it, right? So, and it's from seven years ago. So, and there's no surveillance because this all took place in a, a tent area where Mark Cuban was taking pictures with patrons from the bar, mm -hmm. and apparently that tent did not have um, a, a camera. 
Yeah. So it's look, I think it's going to be a very difficult case to prove because, you know, it goes beyond just alleging something. You have to prove the case. There has to be some evidence. And I don't know if there is evidence outside of this one witness who says that he noticed something strange, but again, didn't say definitively that he saw what the woman is alleging. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that it didn't happen and it doesn't mean that uh, you that if it did happen, it's terrible. He the, the allegation is that he put his hand inside her clothes and then penetrated her with his finger. Uh, that that's really really bad. Uh, but you but we do have a court of law and we do have a justice system and you do have to prove it because what if it didn't happen? And so that's why we have a process. And so it's going to be really really hard to prove whether it happened or it didn't happen. Uh, and and. I don't know why it's coming back up seven years. He's not a politician. I know that he's a well-known guy, and he has a TV show, and he has a basketball team. And so, and then there's the allegations that he was too drunk and he was gropy. You're allowed to be too drunk, so he's denying that he was that drunk. But so what? I don't get it. And gropy, I don't know what that means. Did you see him assault someone? If you did, that means a lot. If you didn't see him. Calling him gropey doesn't mean anything. Right, and also what might appear to be inappropriate conduct for you, I mean, it's really dependent on the women in the case, right? If any other woman was uncomfortable, you know, hopefully she'd go forward to the police. And But anyway, we'll see how this all plays out. Yeah, so just one last time, it's not to diminish the charges if they can be proven they are significant, but it's incredibly hard to prove and there's witnesses in both directions. So take it for what it's worth. We gotta take a break, let's do that. And when we come back, an interesting law just passed in Minnesota. I wanna tell you about it, so just come back. Thanks for watching or listening to this free version of the Young Turks podcast. You know that the full show is at tytnetwork.com slash join. If you become a member, you get the full show ad free. We love you for watching or listening either way. There's gonna be a new free podcast tomorrow, you can keep on doing that. But if you wanna get the full show ad free, tytnetwork.com slash join. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash tyt. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.